Absolutely audible, Ms. Prem. Loud and clear, Dr. Sears. Okay, because I sound odd to myself with the headphones on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so, so guys, there's just unit one overview of the module. Uh, there's chapter three, uh, which deals with uh, polynomial and rational functions. Uh, of course, you guys should feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, I don't know how far you guys are. Like I said, uh, I anticipate you guys working at different rates. So I can't assume everyone is busy with polynomial and rational functions because the tutorial, the, 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 um, the facilitation session started a bit late. So some, some people might be very far with their preparations, okay? So someone may be busy with the binomial theorem or the algebra of matrices or, or complex zeros in the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, that's fine. You are free to ask a question. Uh, but like I said, the topic that I posted was called the factor theorem and the real zeros of polynomials. Okay. Um, okay, guys. So I just want to. Um, I just want to see. Okay, there's, there's nothing in the chat, so everybody seems to be fine. So what I'll do is. I'll. Um, Stop sharing uh, the learning guide and then go to the um, to the whiteboard. Okay, share the whiteboard with you guys. Right. So uh, I trust that you guys can see the whiteboard there. Okay. So so I just want to maybe just um, take a few steps back before I proceed. I just want to say that the division algorithm, so the division algorithm, we had following, just to clarify things again, the, uh, the concepts. The, the division algorithm, we had this kind of thing happening. We had a, a polynomial function, P of X, and we called it the dividend, and then it was divided throughout by some function that we call the divisor function d of x, and then resulted after long division, what? resulted some function, a quotient function q of x, and Dr. then- Dr. Yes, yeah? The board is not, not showing sure you. The... Okay, let me- Not show you no, anything. No problem, let me share again. That's probably, probably, uh, 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 I'm not sure what can happen, but it's good that you tell me the things for that, guys. Right. <clears throat> Can you guys see it now? Yes. yes. Great, great. So I don't know. I, I did the sharing. I did exactly what I did now. So, but it's okay. But thanks for alerting me to that. So, uh, just to take a few steps back, guy, back guys. Uh, we encountered the division algorithm, and with the division algorithm, we divided a divisor function into a function called the dividend. The dividend function p of x, and what we found was the remainder function, uh, a quotient function, and the remainder function, which we call r of x. Uh, that was important, and we have to state when, for example, let me just clarify something, guys. If I have a function, say f of x equal to, say, x to the 4 plus x cubed minus 2x squared, plus one, we call the degree of this function, d e, g of f, we call the degree four, because that's the highest power there, okay? Four, uh, the highest exponent there, okay? Four, the highest power is x to the four, the highest exponent is four. So, of course, uh, uh, this polynomial x cubed here has degree three, this minus two x has degree one, and this number one is degree zero, okay? But overall, we say that that polynomial function, f of x, it has degree four, okay? Just to note that. So this one here, uh, we call it a dividend, okay, the dividend. This one we call the divisor. And this year we call it the quotient. Guys, we call this the quotient. Quotient function, uh, quotient. I'm just recapping again, guys. 
And this we call the remainder function. Remainder function. Now, what you must know is that the degree of the remainder function can be zero or, or it can be uh, it can be less than the degree of uh, the divisor function. So the remainder function, the degree of the remainder function is less than the degree of the divisor function or degree of the remainder function can be equal to zero, meaning it's a constant. So every constant has degree zero, okay? Like this number one, I told you this number one has degree zero, okay? So, but overall, the polynomial f of x has degree four, and it's good. Uh, I'll try and do a little proof for you on the factor theorem. Uh, so it's important to remember that with a division algorithm, the remainder function r of x is degree zero or it's degrees less than the degree of the divisor function, okay? Right. Right. Um, so I want us to go to the factor theorem. Let me check if there are any questions in the in the chat. Um, okay, great. Nothing yet. Okay, I'll just have to go back sometimes. I tend to forget about the chat sometimes. Sorry for that, guys. So if you if you see me, just keep on writing. I'm not ignoring you. I just tend to forget sometimes, okay? It's nothing deliberate. So now we come to what we call the factor theorem. So we've dealt with the division theorem. We've dealt with the remainder theorem also. And, and, and I'm just going to state the remainder theorem again, just the statement, just to check where we are. Uh, statement. So it's just a recap currently. Statement of the remainder theorem. And we did a few examples, I think two examples on it. Statement of the remainder theorem. So if, if the polynomial, it says, if the polynomial, maybe we can prove it also quickly. I didn't prove it last week. Maybe just, maybe I can just prove it. If the polynomial P of X, our dividend, is divided, is divided by some linear factor, x minus c, so highest power there is x to the one, highest exponent is one. C is a constant, okay? Then if you want the remainder, then the remainder, the remainder is the value P of C. And we, we, we showed it by, by various examples, okay? So if I want to prove the remainder theorem, all I have to do, so let me just write down proof here. Here's the statement of the theorem. So it says, if the polynomial function P of X, the dividend, is divided by this linear factor and the remainder, remainder R of X, remainder R of X, um, Remainder R of X this year, uh, if you want that remainder, you just substitute C in the place of X and evaluate P of C, okay? So remember guys, the degree of the remainder is less than the degree of the divisor function or the degree of the remainder function is zero. If the, if the remainder function is a constant, the degree is zero, okay? Right, if it's a polynomial function, the remainder, the degree is, uh, one or greater, okay? Right. So let's just do a proof quickly of this quickly. Okay? Let's see. Let's just prove the statement. So we start off with a polynomial that is divided by X minus C, okay? Right. So, so it means that the divisor function, the divisor function, if the divisor in the division algorithm is of that form X minus C, for some real number C, then the remainder must be constant. So here, my D of X, I'm dividing by X minus C. I'm dividing that into P of X. So if it's divided by X minus C, so X minus C is the divisor function. And, and we know that the remainder R of X, the remainder R of X 
the degree must be less, the degree of this one must be less than the degree of the divisor function. And as you guys can see, oh, it must be zero, right? Or degree of the remainder function. I'm just stating what I stated above there, okay? Right, now you can see the degree of the divisor function is one. This is x to the one, right? So we see the degree currently, the degree of x minus c, the divisor function, is equal to one because the highest exponent is one. Therefore, thus, the degree of the remainder function must be less than that, so it must be equal to zero because it's less than, we already found that it was less than the degree of the divisor. Divisor is x minus c, there's degree one. So what number is uh, the, the first number that's less than one? Well, well, the, the, the lowest value that the degree can assume in this case of the remainder is zero, okay? It's, uh, it's either less than the degree of the, of the divisor or it's zero. The degree of the divisor is one, Therefore, the degree of the remainder function must be zero. Okay. Right. Um, so, and then we can call it a constant because it means that the remainder is some constant, some constant. The degree of a constant is zero. We established that, right? So, so suppose um, the remainder is some, some number r, which has degree zero, okay? Every constant number has degree zero. Um, then we can write from the division algorithm, we can write, we can write, um, and we can write um, polynomial p of x is equal to x minus c, the divisor function, multiplied by uh, q of x. Let me just take this bracket away here. Multiplied by q of x. It's q of x there, guys, okay? But I wanted to write d of x again. It's q of x. d of x is x minus c. So plus your remainder r. Dr. Sears? Okay. Uh, do you have, uh, you know, at the bottom by your screen where you can enlarge it a little bit? Oh, okay. Is it a bit small? Yeah. Okay. Wow, 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 wow. Yes, yes, yes. I have it. I have it. Sorry for that, guys. Thank Thanks you. For that. How's it now? Okay. Is it fine now? Students, is that better? I think, that's, I think, no, 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 no. The 125, yeah. Fine, let me just shift it to the left a bit. Okay, because, okay, great. I think you should see everything now, eh? right? Remember, we wanted to prove that if the polynomial P of X is divided by X minus C, then we wanted to prove that the remainder is equal to P of C, right? So we will prove now that that, we will prove now that the remainder is actually, actually equal to P of C, right? So, so now we substitute x with c, and then we've got c minus c times q of c plus r. And you can see this here gives you zero. So therefore, p of c is indeed the value of p at c is indeed the remainder, because we suppose there for it to be some constant, since the degree of the divisor function in this case was one, meant that the degree of the remainder has to be zero, and therefore chose it as a constant r. And then uh, we just put things together and uh, we had our division algorithm. This is our division algorithm. Of course, if, if we substitute in the place of x, you put c, this becomes zero, and you remain with r. So there is what we have for the remainder. P of C is equal to R, which is what we wanted to prove. So it says if the polynomial P of X is divided by some linear function X minus C, then the remainder is the value P of C, which is what we got, okay? Where R of X is equal to R, okay? Great.
Okay, guys, any questions there, guys? Any questions on the proof? Any questions on the proof, guys? Are you guys fine with that? Right. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any questions, Mr. So So uh, let me proceed now to the factor theorem now. So we've done some applications of that of that remainder theorem. We've done applications last Saturday on it. So let me go back to the factor theorem and let's try and prove that one also and do some applications before we go to the real zeros of polynomials. So the factor theorem states the following. So the factor theorem states. Factor theorem states that uh, C is a zero of P if X minus C is a factor. of p of x. So let me just explain what's a zero again, guys. So for example, I just I just explained what is a zero of a, of a function. Um, so suppose I've got maybe a linear function. In fact, here we've got a linear function. So the highest exponent is one there, degree is one. So if I've got a function, let's say f of x, so I'm not proving this yet. Suppose I've got a function f of x equal to two x minus one. What value for x will make this zero? Well, x equal to half. So we call x equal to half a zero of 2x minus 1. Okay. On the other end, if I have perhaps, let's say, uh, f of x equal to x squared minus 1, right? And you know there are two values. If you want the zeros of that, you know there are two values that will make that zero. And you can see that if you put x equal to one or x equal to minus one, you will get that equal to zero, right? Because minus one squared is one and one minus one is zero and one squared is one and one, one minus one is zero. So now that you have an idea what, is it, what it means to be called a zero of a, um, of a function p of x, sorry, I forgot to say p, Right, yeah. So C is a zero of P if X minus C is a factor of P of X, is a factor of P of X. So let me make this statement again. C is a zero of P if X minus C is a factor of P of X. And we know what it means if I ask you for a factor, if I ask you what are the factors of X squared minus one, for example, if I ask you what are the factors will tell me, oh, it's x minus 1 and x plus 1. Those are the factors. I can multiply those things. If I ask you, give me two factors of 6, it will tell me it's 2 times 3, right? Those prime numbers, right? Those are factors of 6. Of course, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 1, they're also factors of 6, okay? In this case, the factors of x squared plus 1 is x minus 1 and x plus 1, right? So we've counted, we've encountered the notion of a zero and of a factor now, okay? So let's go back to that proof now of the factor theorem. Let's just do the proof of the factor theorem, okay? I should have done these notes on the side, but it's fine. Um, so let's try and prove that theorem. Okay. So we know what's a zero now. So it's that value of x uh, that when you substitute it into the function, in the place of x, you'll get that function value equal to zero, right? That's what happens there. Right. So let's see that. So let's prove this now, and then we'll do one or two applications. So the proof. So C is a zero of P if X minus C is a factor of P of X. So, so let's see, so the proof. So suppose we could write P of X as 
equal to x minus c because we say or we say that we say that c is a zero, right? So if p of x, so this is just an explanation, guys. If p of x factors as this is just an illustration. I've already covered this, but it's fine. It's just an illustration. If p of x factors as as p of x equal to x minus c times q of x, then p of c and p of c equals c is a zero. So c is a zero. So means that p of c is equal to c minus c times q of c, which is equal to zero, right? Right. So, so, um, so I should have said if and only if you guys, if and only if, okay? Because I'm proving now. So what I'm showing to you now, if p is a if if um, x minus c is a factor of p of x, so there x minus c is a factor of p of x, and then there we've got a quotient function q of x, right? So this is my divisor, and uh, there are no there are no remainders there. The remainder zero. So if p of x can be written as the product of x minus c times q of c, this is the first part. I'm doing this part here. The uh, we call this the uh, we call this the necessity part, okay? So so we assume that x minus c is a factor of p of x. So we can write p of x as x minus c times q of x. And p of c is equal to zero, right? So that's okay, right? So we found it. So now we assume p of c is equal to zero. So now we assume c is a zero. So conversely, so there are two parts to the proof. If p of c is equal to naught, well, uh, then by the remainder theorem, by the remainder theorem, let me call it RT, guys, the remainder theorem, but you can't do this in the exam now, okay? Then by the remainder theorem, p e of x is equal to x minus c times q of x plus naught, right? So if p of c, so if p of c is equal to zero, then by the remainder theorem, right? Remember, p of c is the remainder. And if p of c is equal to naught, we found that p of c is the remainder. Just go back to that. Doctor, yes. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Um, just wondering if you've seen the in the chat box. Of okay, when is, oh, where is the Q of X coming from? Okay. Yes. Well, uh, remember we said we said that when we have a factor. So, for example, uh, so so let me just clarify that for you guys. Uh, remember from the theorems that we did. So, if you divide a polynomial by a divisor function. So you see what we said. First, I first want to say the following before I answer this question. So remember, if a polynomial is divided by some linear factor from the, the remainder theorem, and the remainder is the value p of c. Okay. So I just want to say that part first. The remainder is p of c. So now we're saying for the factor theorem, if p of c is equal to zero, which means this is the remainder, if the remainder is zero, then by the remainder theorem, P of X can just be written as X minus C times Q of X. Remember, if the remainder is zero, every function, for example, if I say to you X squared minus one, I can have it maybe as X minus one times X plus one. Right, the remainder is zero. So in this case, what I probably did was I looked at X squared minus one and I divided it by, let's say, I divided it by x minus one, and I got x plus one. So cross multiplication gives me this. Now this is this here is my divisor function. 
my d of x. And this one is my q of x, my quotient function. So every dividend p of x, if you divide it by a divisor function, x minus 1, it will either have um, a quotient function qx plus 1 plus some remainder. But because here our remainder is 0 as we stated, all we have is just x minus c times q of x. This is my divisor x minus c, and q of x is my quotient function. So that when the remainder is 0, like in this case here, it always has some quotient multiplied by some divisor function. The remainder is 0. So if you look at the, the onset, how we started, uh, you could have asked me, where does this Q of X also come from? Yeah. Right. So what the division algorithm says is that if you have some function P of X, you divide it by D of X. You can, you, you will always multiply by some function Q of X, always exists, plus some remainder. Sometimes this remainder is a constant, the degree is less, the degree is less than the remain, the degree of the, of the of the divisor function or zero. Okay, so you'll always have this kind of scenario. For our proof, this remainder happened to be zero. The proof that we're doing now for the factor theorem. So when I talk of factors, I do not expect a remainder. For example, like I showed you when I factorized when I factorized x squared minus one. X squared minus one is x minus one times x plus one. There was no remainder there. Remainder is zero. Okay, there's no remainder. You don't need to write the zero. So if I divided by x minus one, this is my q of x. Okay, and here's my remainder zero, which is what we did for our proof. Because in the proof, we did the first part of the proof. The first part of the proof says if x minus c is a factor of p of x, right, means you can write p of x like that, right? Right, and then you show that p of c is a zero. You show that p of c is a zero, and then sorry, and then you show that p of c equal to zero, that c is a zero, and then you substitute in the place of x, you substitute c, and there you have it, zero. So c is indeed a zero of p of x. Okay, and on the second hand, in the second instance, if you suppose that c is a zero, then p of c is not, but p of c is by the factor theorem the remainder. By the factor theorem is the remainder, right? The remainder, and therefore that remainder is equal to zero. So then by the remainder theorem, you only need to concern yourself with these two factors, that's all, which is the quotient function and the divisor function, right? And, uh, and that's all you have there. So then, then uh, so in that instance, we show that x minus c is a factor of p of x because you only have x minus c times q of x. This part here that I circled is just for illustration here, okay? Uh, someone just asked where is the q of x coming from? Then I constructed a particular p of x. Uh, there's my x minus c, and there's my q of x. My remainder is zero. Okay. I hope I hope that explains that. So that's it. Right. Okay. Any questions there, guys? Is the person clarified? I think it was fortunate. Are you okay with the with the Q of X now, guys? You're fine with the Q of X. That that is what we started from with from the onset. Okay. Uh, fortunate. Are you okay with that? Okay. okay, great, great. So you must just remember the remainder theorem, the division algorithm, uh, the remainder theorem, and then now we have the factor theorem. So the factor theorem says, if C is a zero of P, meaning that P of C is equal to zero, uh, then X minus C is a factor of P of X. And it says that if X minus C is a factor of P of X, then C is a zero of P. So that statement goes two ways, the factor theorem. It says if C is a zero of, of P, then X minus C is a factor of P of X. If X minus C is a factor of X, then P of C equal to zero. Okay. That's what it says. Okay. Right. 
So, so there are two aspects to that proof. Okay, right. You just go back to the whiteboard again. So let's do an example quickly to illustrate that, guys. So let's just do an example there. And uh, from the old edition that I have, it's example five. It's uh, example five from the sixth edition. Yeah, it's from the sixth edition. It's from the sixth edition. Right, so it goes like this. It goes like this. It says that uh, let you must bear in mind that result now. Let p of x equal to x cubed minus seven x plus six. Okay, so that's what we have. It's a dividend function. Right, they say show that. Show that. Show that p of one is equal to zero. And use this fact. And use this fact. Use this fact. To factor. Factor. P of X completely. Completely, okay. Right. I remind you what the theorem says, guys. Completely. So, uh, so what we'll do is we'll substitute. We'll substitute one into P of X. So wherever we see X, we put one. Let me just check if I wrote this down correctly. Show that P of one is zero. So we must show that on the substitution, on substituting one in the place of X, uh, we find that p of one is equal to zero. Let's see the solution. Let's do the substitution, guys. Okay, solution. So p of one, p of one, is equal to one cubed, one cubed minus seven times one plus six. And I think everyone can see there it's seven minus seven, which is equal to zero. So from the factor theorem, one is indeed a zero of that function p of x. Thus, therefore, um, show that oh, this says show that p of one is equal to zero. Ah, let me just see this, guys. This was incomplete here. Show that p of one equal to zero, which we found. We show that. And use this fact to factor p of x completely. Okay, we must factorize p of x completely. Thus, one is a zero of p of x because at one p of x is equal to zero, right? So we found the spot, and now we have to use that fact to factor p of x completely. We must factorize this function now making use of that fact. Now the factor theorem says, says that, says that uh, c, c is zero if and only if x minus c is a factor. C is a zero, c is a zero, c is a zero. Sorry guys, I forgot to write a zero. C is a zero of p. So there we found one is a, is a, is a zero of p. If and only if x minus c, e, so x minus one is a factor of p of x, right? So x minus one is a factor. So we found one is a zero. Therefore, from the factor theorem, x minus one is a factor of p of x. So factor of p of x. And now we resort to long division. Now, now we divide. P of X that we have here on top, we divide it by X minus one to get the quotient function Q of X, okay? So, so we'll have our divisor function is X minus one. It's one of the factors there. And we're now trying to find the other factor Q of X, okay? So, so let's do long division now. Our function is X cubed minus seven X plus six, okay? So I must say, so I'm doing this now, P of X, 
divided by q of a, divided by d of x, sorry. I devise a function. And this is uh, x cubed minus seven x plus six divided by the factor x minus one, which is my divisor functional. And this is how we're going to write it. This is how we're going to write it. We do long division now. And this is how we approached it on set three. You guys will remember, okay? Right. So now we divide this by x minus one. So we're not now trying to find our q of x. Okay, we need to find q of x because we want to write this in this form. We want to be able to write p of x as d of x times q of x. That's what we want to do. Of course, the remainder is zero because we see x minus one is a factor of p of x. Right. So, so now what we do is we divide the power, this power x to the one into that power x cube. And we see it goes in the x squared times. Right? Because x times x squared is x cubed. And now we multiply x by x squared and minus 1 by x squared. We have x cubed minus x squared. That's what we have, okay? Let me just allow some space here, guys. Maybe just uh, to confuse you guys, but I just want to write this, allow some space here for that x squared factor. So let me just write it a bit further apart. 7x plus 6, yeah. 7x plus 6. So now, like I said, I multiply x squared by x, and I multiply x squared by minus 1. So I've got x cubed and minus 1 times x squared, it's minus x squared. Now <clears throat> I subtract the bottom terms from the top terms. So the sign changes, the signs change here, change of signs. Change of signs, okay. Right, change of signs. So I'm doing a subtraction now, guys. Let's see. And we'll probably have to bring down that minus seven x. We'll have to probably bring it down also. Okay. Right. So now I'm subtracting x cubed minus x cubed is zero. And then, well, we have a minus seven x there. Okay. We have a minus seven x. I should write the minus closer to that actually. To be fair, minus seven x. And then the change, the signs change here now. The signs change. So I've got x squared, and I bring the 7x, the minus 7x, I bring it down now. And then I start everything over again. It's like an algorithm, okay? Just repeat, the process repeats itself. So uh, now I ask myself, how many times does uh, x go into, how many times does this x here, I'll show you now, guys. How many times does this x here go into x cubed? Right? Oh, sorry, I got that. Sorry, I must just let's just rephrase that. Let me let me rephrase that. Okay, guys. The question is, how many times does this x go into x squared here? Okay. Well, it goes in there x times, and now we multiply again by that and by that. We multiply each of x and minus 1 by x again. I'll repeat the process. So now I multiply x by x. We already finished the x squared and minus 1 by x. Okay, let's see what we have. So now we have, uh, we have x times x is x squared. And then x times minus 1 is minus x. And again, I subtract the signs change now. So I've got x squared minus x squared. And now this becomes a positive, and this becomes a negative. Okay. But when I do that, so this becomes the sign changes here. So I'm left with minus 6x. Then I can bring down the 6 there. I bring down the 6. 
bring it down. Now I ask myself again. So there was a positive six, I bring it down. Now I ask myself again, how many times does this x, how many times does this x divide into minus six x? Well, down there, minus six times. And then I multiply minus six by x and by x minus one. Okay. I multiply the minus six with x, uh, this x here. We just erase this here, guys. So it's like an algorithm, like I said, it repeats itself. This is what we did on Saturday most of the time, okay? So you'll see the process repeats itself. It's just a, a, a judicious division with the highest um, power, with the other highest power, the divisor power. So now we multiply out. So we multiply this by that, and we also multiply this by that. So six times x is six x, and then minus six times minus one is plus six. Uh, that was x minus one, eh? Let me just see, I'm missing something here. That's plus six. Okay, then there appears to be a problem somewhere. Uh, let me just see, guys, if I did this correctly here. Uh, this goes in the x squared minus x. I'm subtracting minus six, I bring that down. It goes in the minus six. Oh, I forgot this here, guys. Remember here, guys, minus six times x is minus six x, yeah. And then minus one times minus six is plus six. And if you subtract all those, you get zero, okay? So there's no remainder. So therefore, therefore after doing this, the quotient is x squared, q of x is x squared plus x minus six, okay? So thus far, now a cross multiplication, Cross multiplication will give you, I'm not done yet. Cross multiplication will give you minus x cubed minus 7x plus 6. This here is my d of x, and here is my q of x. Right? This here is my d of x. This here is my q of x. I just found the quotient, which I can split up further. And a cross multiplication, cross multiplication gives me that that x cubed minus 7x plus 6 is equal to x minus 1 multiplied by x squared plus x minus 6. I can factorize this further here. Okay. I can factorize that further. So that I've got x plus 3 times x minus 2. Right. And then you guys can check there. You get the desired result. Right. OK, so and we use that to factor P of X and this is this was my P of X guy. OK, this was my P of X, which happens to be Q of X times D of X. OK, right. Uh, I've got a question for you guys now. I've got a question for you guys. Um, I want to know from you guys, what are the zeros of P of X? Right. What are all the zeros of P of X? Okay. Right. Let's see quickly. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, um, Sprum, this is just a question, but I think it's something that you normally answer at the end regarding recordings. Okay. Um, yeah, it's fine. Guys, those, those questions on recordings, Ms. Prim deals with those questions, uh, but I think she'll address that soon. Okay, uh, Nzalama, Nzalama. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, on that question that they have asked. The, okay, the zeros, the zeros. Yeah, yeah. so okay. since we have the factors, we can right. equate right. each and every factor equals to zero. So right. it right. means that the x right. would will be equals okay. to one, x equals to minus three, and x equals to two. Great, great. It says, Zalama, uh, Zalama no? yeah. says that, it says that uh, if you have, now we've, we've completely factorized or factored 
the polynomial p of x. And we ended up with, uh, with uh, sorry guys, x plus three, x minus two, because we had to factor the quadratic again. And what he says, put this equal to zero now. Then he says, therefore, x, he says x minus one equal to zero, or x plus three equal to zero, or uh, x minus two, equal to zero. That's what he's saying. So he says, if you want the zeros, equate each of those three factors to zero. Therefore, uh, the one zero, which we already know, it's x equal to one. We started off with that one. That's how we were able to do the long division. Or x equal to negative three, or x equal to two. Great, that's what he said. So there are my zeros for that polynomial function. Okay. Right. Thanks for that, Nzalama. Uh, uh, Thanks for that, Ms. Prem. Oh, okay, Lerato also had it, I think. Yeah, great, great. Okay, thanks, Lerato. Right, good. So I think, uh, I don't think there are, uh, oh, there's a minus, six. oh, thanks for that. Oh, Nail corrected me there. Thanks, Nail. The minus 6x, thanks for that. Okay. Uh, guys, Neil was just correcting me on this blunder that I committed here. So I saw that now. Yeah, this is the blunder that I committed somewhere when I was incorrectly multiplying minus six with x. Okay. Great. Thanks for that, Neil. I see that now. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, so Tian, there will be a recording, and Ms. Ms. Prem will address those issues of recordings. Okay. Uh, great. So let's proceed to another example related to the factor theorem. So we will now be finding a polynomial with specified zeros, and then we'll go on to the real zeros of polynomials. Okay. So let's just go onto the whiteboard again. I'll just do one more example on the factor theorem, and then you guys should be fine with it. Okay. Um, so let's just call this. I think from my book, it's called. From the sixth edition that I'm using, it's called example six. Example six. And guys, listen, let me just say something that uh, after this example, if someone is ahead, we can look at his or her questions that they have. I don't mind. Uh, otherwise, we'll just proceed to go on with uh, real zeros of polynomials, okay? Right, so I don't mind that. So any other questions, you can pose it just after this problem, okay? Right. So uh, uh, let me just write down this example. It says, find a polynomial find a polynomial uh, of degree four. So the polynomial is degree four of degree four. So it means that the highest power there is x to the four. I don't know what the coefficient is, but we know that the highest power is x to the four, okay? That has zeros. That has zeros minus three. Uh, zeros also zero there, one and five and five, no? Right. So find a polynomial of degree four that has zeros minus one, zero, one, and five. Okay. So um, so the solution of this, so that is fine. So this, there, are, there are four there are four zeros there. So that makes it easier, and the polynomial is degree four. So so um, so by the factor theorem, by by the factor theorem. I'll call it FT by the factor theorem. Like I said, you guys can't write this in the exam, okay? Unless you've already explained it to the lecturer. FT will stand for factor theorem. By the factor theorem, um, we'll have X minus minus three is a factor. Uh, we'll have X minus naught is a factor. Uh, we'll also have x minus 1 as a factor, and we'll also have x minus 5 as a factor. 
Okay. Uh, they are all factors. All factors of the required polynomial. They are all factors of the required polynomial. So you guys have a notch in sometimes of the required polynomial. the required p of x mm -hmm. polynomial that's okay so that um, so we can say uh let p of x what is that guys let p of x equal to now this is x plus three this is x this, this remains the same this remains the same. So P of X will be X plus three times X times X minus one times X minus five times X minus one. So what it doesn't really matter because multiplication is commutative times X minus five. Uh, can you guys just multiply that out guys and see what you get there? To multiply all those things out. Can you just can, can you guys just multiply and see what you get? Uh, see if you agree with them. So this is just a nice test for you quickly. So they have x to the four. They have x to the four minus three x cubed. You guys can just confirm. Uh, minus thirteen x squared plus fifteen x. There's one possible polynomial, okay? Plus 15x. Um, this here. Plus 15x. Right. So that's why they have, there's no constant there, okay? So it's x to the 4 minus 3x squared minus 13x squared plus 15x. So any other solution will be a multiple, a constant multiple of this. So, so you might find that any other solution will be of this form. Uh, it can be some constant in front there, maybe some number, let's say um, K. Okay, some real number is also a solution. It's a constant multiple of that, okay? But of course, so you can choose any real number there. It will also be a solution, any coefficient. Uh, otherwise, that is fine, just like that. That is one of the solutions, one of the possible solutions. Okay. Fine. So it's just a multiple of that. Okay. So there is a, and you guys can check. We can put let let's put um five in there. Let's test five quickly. Let's test five. Right. Well, they say this is zero, so we expect five to be an answer. So for example, you don't need to do this. They've already asked you. They said find a polynomial of degree four that has zeros, minus three, zero, one, and five. Let's, let's, let's check five, P of five. Let's check quickly. You don't need to do this part, guys. So it's five to the four, minus three, five cubed, times five cubed, minus 13, times five squared, uh, plus, 15 times 5. You guys can just do that. Um, and see what you get there. So it's 625, I think. 625. And then I think this is 375, I think. Oh, what is it? Oh, my bad. Uh, it's 125. Yeah. yeah. And then minus and then 13 times 25. So it's 65325. Just double check my work there, guys. Plus 75. Okay. Uh just check there, guys. Uh so 625 doesn't seem right. Just double check what I did there, guys, please. So uh, yeah, it seems fine, eh? Equal to zero. Seems alright, yeah. Okay, 
Minus 700 is zero. Yeah. So five is a root, which which they already confirmed it's a root. Okay, so sometimes we say uh, those zeros, we also give them a name to say they are the roots of that polynomial. So sometimes you actually will say that has roots minus three, zero, one, and five. Okay, right. You guys, any any questions there? Yeah, that was relatively simple. So. Uh... We'll come to the to the rational zeros of polynomials. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah. And then we'll do a little bit of a theorem, and maybe we'll, we can see if we can prove the theorem, and then maybe one or two examples initially. And then, but I just want to check if there's any any of you guys who are working ahead. Uh, there, there's a question maybe that you wanted to ask me, maybe in complex numbers or trigonometry or or linear algebra. Okay, anything that you might be betting with, guys. Okay, doesn't appear to be anything. Okay, so that's fine then. Right. Okay, so no one seems to have a question there. So uh, now we come to real zeros of polynomials, real zeros of polynomials. OK, so this is a subsection 3.4. Uh, well, let me say section 3.4. And it deals with real zeros of polynomials. Real zeros of polynomials, sorry for that, guys. Okay. Okay, great stuff, guys. So in that case, um, uh, we consider a polynomial of linear factors composed of linear factors, and we multiply it out, and then we just want to see what what is happening. What what can we deduce from that polynomial, and then we'll state the theorem. Uh, we don't necessarily have to prove it because I know the proof can be a bit awkward sometimes for some people. And then we'll just use the uh, the rational zeros theorem. I just want to check with you guys if you know what's a rational number first before we start. Um, and then we can talk of rational zeros perhaps. Let me just try and check with you guys if you know what is a rational number, okay? What is a rational number? Right. This wasn't well drawn. Ah. Okay, guys, any one of you want to tell me what is a rational number? Anyone want to tell me what's a rational number, guys? Because you can have complex zeros, guys. So that's why we call this one real zeros. Okay. All right. So uh, my question is, what is a? Uh, oh, someone says they are muted. Lebuchan, uh, guys, can you hear me? Guys, can you hear me there? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Oh, to someone, someone just said they are muted. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I thought it was a general problem, guys. I, I can hear you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh, okay. Tepo, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. So I'm not sure, Lebuchan, maybe there's a problem on your side. I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe it's a, a connection issue there. Okay. Right. Uh, so, so people, of course, uh, I, my question was what is a rational number? Is there anyone that would like to venture an answer? Because I will talk now of rational zeros also. What is a rational number? Uh, I'm sure you've heard this term, a uh, rational number, an irrational number, and so forth. Okay. So, of course, if you know what's a rational number, then you should, it follows logically what's an irrational number. Okay. Right. So 
Well, guys, what is a rational number? Because we will encounter the notion of the rational zeros theorem. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. Um, I can try. Okay, great. Really no sure problem. I'm... No problem. Who is speaking now? Oh, I was in... Lerato. Oh, Lerato. Okay, Lerato. I'm not really sure how to define it properly, but I would say integers and numbers that can also be written as simple fractions. Okay, you are very close. Yeah, you're very close. You're very close. Uh, maybe just one 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 refinement. It's absent there. Okay. Uh, okay. I think you are ninety something percent there. So someone says, Lebuchan says, any number that can be written as a fraction p over q, which is more or less what you try to say. So, uh, so in the uh, in the chat box in the chat uh, there, uh, uh, Lebuchan says, any number that can be written as p over q. Uh, let me just see what else he says there. Uh, as a fraction p over q, but there's this. There, there are two. There are two points missing there. There are two points missing. He says any number that can be written as a fraction p over q. Okay, that's that's sort of nearly there. But I think Lerato said something more. She said something more. What what must be in q b, guys? What must be in q b? Lerato, I think you mentioned it. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Madzimbalala. Okay. M Madzimbalala says. P and Q must be integers. Then there's one more refinement missing. So rational number R. Say, uh, so this is not the remainder. This is a rational number. A rational number. So I call it R, OK? Rational number R, say. So there's a rational number. This is not the remainder now. It's a rational number. So yeah, R denotes a rational number. It can be written as P over Q, where P and Q they belong to the integers. So they are integers like P and Q are integers like minus one, two, three hundred, minus five hundred, minus four, minus twenty, ten. So P and Q are integers. And then there's one more condition missing. There's one more condition missing. Q must not be zero. Thanks, Mazimbalala. He says, also, Maporto says, Q cannot be equal to zero. Great, thanks, guys. Great, there's the refinement. Also, Q cannot equate to zero. Otherwise, if it was the case, you'll have an undefined number, okay? So Q must not be equal to zero. So the rational number R is a number that can be written as P over Q. Uh, where p, both p and q are integers, and the, the the denominator q is not equal to zero. Right. So that's it. Thanks for that, guys. Good. So let us just do a simple multiplication now and say some things about about certain factors of the of of um. I say I say say certain things about uh, the constant term. Okay, that will come up. Uh, so I think that's important. So then you guys can see. And then there's a nice proof on that, but I'm not going to do the proof. So let me just write down. Um, so we call this rational zeros of polynomials. So now we have a subsection. Doctor here. Okay, great. Sorry, are you writing? Uh, no, I'm about to start. I'm about to start. Is your last writing P slash Q? Yeah, P slash Q, yeah, it's my last. And there I said, and there okay. I said, uh, I haven't started yet. And there uh -huh. I said, P and Q are element of some, uh, we call it the integers. They should know this notation. Okay, can you write something on the board? Because we all confused if we can see. Okay, okay. I'm writing now rational zeros of polynomials. So I said the real zeros. And now I'm writing. Yeah, I'm busy writing, yeah. Okay, then we can't see. Okay, great. Now let me, maybe it's a network thing there eh? from my side, yeah. perhaps. Okay, yeah. let me then share the screen again, guys. Sorry for that. Uh, it's good. Thanks for that, guys. Thanks for alerting me because I was using to talk to myself here. Uh, great. Great. Are, are you able to see that now, guys? 
Yes. Um, great stuff. Yes. Great, great. yes. Okay. So 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 that that's what that's what that's what the people said. Uh, three three or two people said a rational number. I call it R. So it's not 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 the remainder in this context. A rational number R can be written as as a quotient of two integers. So P divided by Q, but such that Q is not equal to zero because division by zero is not permissible. Okay, great. So now remember for the real numbers. So we're talking of real zeros of polynomials, and now we come to rational zeros. So now we know what's a rational number. And now in particular, we deal with a subsection. I can call it 3.4.1, uh, but let me, they don't refer to, it in, to anything in particular as a subsection, but the hinting at that, this is called now rational zeros. So we know what's a rational number now. Rational zeros of polynomials. A rational number is a subset of the real numbers, okay? The, rational, the set of rational numbers is a subset of the real numbers. So rational zeros of polynomials now. Right. Great. Rational zeros of polynomials. So what we have, so um, I just want to say in, in, in fancy in fancy notation, we'll say that the real numbers contain the rationals. So yeah, normally in, in pure mathematics, that Q with that uh, that funny Q looking Q. That denotes the set of all rational numbers, and we say that it's a subset, it's a proper subset of what we call the real numbers. Okay. Right. Okay. So there's. It. Okay, guys. So uh, so before I move on, I wanted to say one or two more things. So so this year refers to the set of rationals. The rationals. Sometimes we say the rationals, okay, for the rational numbers. The set of rationals, set of rationals, and these are the set of reals. So the set of rational numbers uh, is a subset of the set of reals. These are the set of reals, okay? These are the reals between minus infinity and positive infinity. Those are all the numbers included there, okay? Right. Of course, you guys can see from there, that the integers is a subset of the rational numbers. Uh, just, just to maybe uh, elicit some more responses from you guys. Uh, how would you guys define the irrational numbers? How would you guys define the irrational numbers? How would you define the irrational numbers? Well, uh, if the rationals are to be written as uh, the quotient of two integers, it means the irrationals, uh, irrationals can't be written, irrationals, irrational numbers, Cannot be written as P over Q. So you can't find two integers. So irrational numbers cannot be written as P over Q. As, uh, an, an example of an irrational number is the square root of two. I think, uh, yeah. So an example. An example of an irrational number is the square root of two. Uh, there are other examples also, like square root of three, etc. Square root of five, uh, square root of seven, uh, square root of six. Uh, those are irrational numbers, okay? Right. Doctor, so, yes. hello? I'm sorry, are you writing? Yes, I'm writing. I'm writing. Yeah. Okay, then I'm. I'm not sure if it's just me. I cannot see oh. what the last thing I see you've written was reels. Okay. Wow. Is that and is I that the case for everyone else, guys? Uh, is, is that the case for everyone else? Yes. 
Wow, yes, sir. I wonder. Yes, yes. Maybe the last uh, okay. zeros of polynomials. Guys, you should really, you should alert me to that, okay? Let me just try. Okay, I think maybe it's a problem with my Wi-Fi. Let me just try my mobile data then. Uh, sorry for that, guys. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay, I've just switched on my mobile data. And, uh, okay. Let me just try and share the screen again. Uh, that's just bad. Sorry for that. Let me stop sharing. Share again. Okay. Wow, this is bad. Okay. Can you guys see the screen now? Yeah, boo. Okay, my apologies, guys, but just alert me because I was I, I thought I was talking to you guys. I was asking the question. So if you know what's a rational number now, the quotient of two integers such that the denominator is not equal to zero. So my question was, what is an irrational number now? Okay. So an irrational number, I said, it cannot be written as p over q, where p and q are integers. Okay. You can't find. So you it, you cannot write this p over q for p and q integers. Uh, for p q integers. Or P, Q elements, they belong to the integers. You can't find such two uh, numbers, which you can write that way, where P and Q are elements of the integers. Okay. All right. So let me just write this nicer. Can you guys still see what I'm writing, I guess? Yes. Okay. So I'm writing the integers as the Z. Uh, I think it's taken from the German. It's called Zahlen. Okay. So the integers, uh, I think in German it's Zahlen. So, yeah, Zahlen. So that's integers. Anyway, so an, uh, 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 a basic example of an irrational number is the square root of two. There are other irrational numbers like square root of three, two, square root of three, square root of five, square root of seven, square root of six, square root of uh, ten, etc. Okay, right. Okay, so. Uh, um, uh, then there's uh, then there are other irrational numbers called transcendental irrational numbers. Uh, transcendental irrational numbers. So I just want to trigger your curiosity with other things. I'm coming back to the main line of thought now. And there's also another set. These ones are called algebraic numbers. Okay. So your 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 rationals because you can you can locate this on the real line. You can use your theorem of Pythagoras. You can actually locate this number, square root of two. You can locate those rational numbers also. You can locate these algebraic numbers. So algebraic numbers, these are numbers that are that, that, that include the rational numbers and uh, your irrational that square root of two, square root of three that you can find on the red line. But there's another set of numbers called the transcendental irrational numbers, which you cannot locate on the real line transcendental irrational numbers, like, uh, for example, uh, pi, for example. And then there's this number that you'll encounter, E, uh, which is Euler's constant. And it's a number on your calculator. It's about 2.718281, something like that. And then it goes on there. And also pi, remember pi is not 22 over seven, it is just a rational approximation to it, okay? So pi is also a transcendental irrational number. You cannot locate it exactly on the real line. Unlike this, you can locate it though it's irrational. Right, but those things you'll encounter later in your studies, okay? Right, so now we were discussing rational zeros of polynomials, so let me just write it down again for the sake of completeness. So we're discussing real zeros of polynomials, in particular now a subset, Rational zeros of polynomials. Rational zeros of polynomials. Right? That's what we're looking at now. So, uh, so before we before we go on with the next theorem, we consider the following polynomial p of x. So it is just uh, an interesting case. It, it is comprised of linear factors, x minus two, x plus three, x minus three, sorry, 
uh, and uh, x plus 4. And of course, you guys can tell me what the roots are there or the this is in the factored form. OK, it's factored. So we factorize this polynomial. Of course, the zeros or the roots are 2, 3 and minus 4. You guys can see that, right? If you multiply this out and you guys can verify, this is what you get. Uh, X cubed. Minus X squared. Minus 14 X. Plus 24. Plus 24. And now. Uh, if you look at it, number 24. Uh, it's just this part here, the two times three times four, negative two times negative three times four gives you 24. Those are the factors of 24 there, okay? Those ones, you see that 24, that number 24, if you look at that constant there, it can be written as negative two times negative three times four, okay? Which gives you that. Right. So this means that the zeros of the polynomial are all factors of the constant term. OK, of course, the zeros are two, three and minus four. But it means they are all factors because two, three and four, no matter if it's plus or minus, they are factors of 24. OK, right. Of that constant term. And then and then that leads us into what we call the rational zeros theorem now. OK, we know what's a rational number now. And now we speak of what we call the rational zeros theorem. So I'm just, I won't prove it. I'll just make a statement now, okay? The rational zeros theorem. This is important theorem. Rational zeros theorem. Uh, rational zeros theorem. Right. So the rational zeros theorem, what does it say? It says, if the polynomial P of X, and I'll explain these things for you, if the polynomial, <clears throat> if the polynomial P of X, if the polynomial P of X, Let's do the spelling correctly again. It's polynomial. Uh, Ms. Prem, you can see my screen there. Eh? Can you guys see my screen there? Eh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. So I was I just want to be sure I'm not talking to myself here. Yeah? If the polynomial P of X equal to uh, and we'll write it in the general form here. I'll explain everything now, now, guys. A subscript N, X to the N. So this is A subscript N. A subscript N. Uh, X to the N plus A subscript N minus one times X to the N minus one. And you can go on plus a subscript n minus two times x to the minus two plus. So there are terms missing in between here. There are terms missing, which are, we don't we can't put all of them. We don't know what the value of n is. Uh, and then the second last term is uh, a one x to the one plus a subscript naught. Right. So, so if the if this polynomial, so people here, my a n a n minus one a n minus two up a n a one a naught, those are real coefficients. Okay, right? They are they are coefficients. They are integer coefficients. Okay, so these a i's here, they are integers. These ones here that you see here, these belong to the integers. Okay, and they are constants. They are integers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 6, minus 20, minus 40. They are integers, okay? These ones here, they are, they are constant coefficients. 
Okay, and then your your variable of interest there is the x. Okay, right. Uh, if the polynomial has integer coefficients, has integer coefficients, oh, why this pen is so delayed? I'm not sure we're going to fit with the set settings there. So if this polynomial has integer coefficients, right? If the polynomial P of X has integer coefficients, then every, we'll break it down nicely down and see what it means. Then, Every rational zero and every rational zero of P of P of the polynomial P is of the form. Is of the form P over Q. And is of that form P over Q. Uh, where where P is a factor of the constant coefficient A naught. Where P is a factor of the constant coefficient A naught, A subscript naught, and Q this is A naught, uh, sorry guys, uh, A subscript naught, this is A subscript naught, oh, but I can't write like that. I need you guys to see this properly. Uh, a naught and Q is a factor of the leading coefficient a n <clears throat> and Q is Q is a factor of a n. We call this the leading coefficient because the highest power is attached to that one x to the n. Ah, good. Okay, guys, so uh, so so it says the rational zero theorem says if the polynomial P of X equal to, and I've explained those a n's, a n minus one, a one, a naught, those are integer coefficients, okay? They're constants. They belong to the integers. They can be minus two, minus one, uh, one, three, four, eighty, one million, whatever, okay? So if the polynomial P of X equal to a subscript n X to the n, plus a subscript n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus, 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 there are terms in between there, plus a 2x squared, plus a 1x, plus a naught, as integer coefficient. So each one of those a n's are integer coefficient. Then every rational zero, rational zero, well, what's a zero? If I substitute a value for x and it gives me, if I substitute a value c and it gives me zero in the place of x, that c is called the zero of that polynomial. It says then every rational zero, which is of the form P over Q, right? P, P is a factor of A naught this year. P is a factor of A naught. And Q is a factor of A N, right? So that's how you can, and then they prove that. And Q is a factor of A N here at A N. And then the, that, that's, the, that's the Q. And then the P is a factor of that. That's how they, and then they have a nice proof on that, okay? So I don't want to do the proof with you because uh, if you if you need, if you tried to understand the proof and you couldn't, um, I don't mind helping you with the proof. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I want you guys also to check with the lecturer concerned how important some of these theorems are. I just proved now and again a theorem that I feel is nice, quite nice for you to understand. This one is also not difficult. You just have to remember what is a zero and so on. What's a rational number? That's why I ask you, what is a rational number? And you could be able to tell me that a rational number R is the quotient of two integers P and Q such that Q is not equal to zero, okay? Um, so if the polynomial P of X equal to A subscript N X to the N plus A subscript N minus one X to the N minus one plus 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 A one X plus A naught is integer coefficients, then every rational zero of P is of the form P over Q, where P, the small P, this is big P, man. This is big P, guys, and this is this is big P. Uh, just to avoid confusion, it's big P, and this is the small P, right? Where P is a factor, that's the P there, is a factor of a naught there, and Q, small Q, Q there. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, sorry, it's been. But the Q that I'm referring to is that Q there. And that is a factor of the leading co is, is a factor of the leading coefficient a n. We call this a n the leading coefficient because it's attached to the highest power x to the n. Okay. Right. And now uh, we will we will use that uh, theorem to do the next example. Okay. Uh, right. Um, so uh, I'm just going to check if there are any questions for clarification. Okay, guys, any questions there? Can you guys still see the whiteboard? Yes, we can. Okay, I just have a question before I proceed. Thanks, thanks, Tabiso. I just have a question to you guys before I proceed, just to check your understanding. So the polynomial that we wrote down on top was like this, the one that I started off. It looked like this. Consider, consider P of X, um, consider P of X equal to uh, the one that I just multiplied out on top, X cubed minus X squared minus X squared uh, minus 14x minus 14x uh, plus 24. Okay, so uh, that is the one that we multiplied out when we started off, guys. That's the one we multiplied out when we started off. So we had x cubed minus x squared minus 14x plus 24. And then and then we established that the zeros there, the two, three, and four, the minus two, minus three, uh, uh, four. We established that that those numbers are factors of twenty-four, the constant coefficient there. Okay, right. So I wanted to ask you, in this context, what is n equal to? What is n equal to? Um, what is um so so we wrote p of x is equal to a n a n x to the n uh on the y in spins plus and then we wrote it plus a n minus one. A n minus one, x to the n minus one. So n minus one, uh, plus ah, hey guys, there's some delay here with this writing. Plus, so I just want to check your understanding of this notation. And then you can go on a n minus two. Well, we didn't go that far. A minus two, x to the n minus two. Plus then and then we had 
we got we went on paired plus a one x to the one plus a naught plus a naught. Okay. There's my a naught there. Okay. Great. Okay, guys. So my question is, what is uh what is our n equal to in this case? What is n equal to in this case? For our case, yeah. Talking about our particular case here. What is what is n equal to? And then what is my a n minus one? What is my a n? Okay. And then and what is my a naught? What is my a naught equal to? Uh, what is my a1 equal to, and so forth, and so forth. Um, Let me see how you guys will answer that, okay? So what is a naught? Uh, what is a1? A1, and what is a2? A two. Uh, so a naught, a one, a two, and a three. Sometimes see. A subscript three. Uh, so I just want you to make sense of that abstract writing now. I wanted to have a sense from you guys. What is my a naught? What is my a one? In our context for that polynomial x cubed minus x squared, minus 14x plus 24. What would you say? What is a one? What is a naught for us? Okay. Uh, let me just go back to the whiteboard. Can anyone tell me what is n equal to for our case here? What is our n equal to? I think everyone can see that n is equal to three, right guys? n is three, right? And you can see the coefficient attached to it is one. It's one times x cubed, right? And you can also see that a two, a two is minus one for us. A two is minus one for us, okay? Right? And a one, a one, for us is equal to negative 14. Negative 14, okay. All right. The one is negative 14. And uh, we have that a naught is 24. It's 24. Okay. 24. All right. So that's how it works. So our n is equal to 3. So a3 is equal to 1. A2 is equal to minus 1. A3 is minus 14, and um, sorry, A1 is minus 14, A0 is 24, A3 is 1. Okay, so N is equal to 3. That's my highest power there, X cubed. Okay, so I was just trying to maybe make you guys understand the general form on top P of X equal to A subscript and X to the N. Okay, I just wanted you to understand that. So we are dealing with integer coefficients there. Okay, those are all integers that are down there, minus 1. Minus 14, 24, and so forth. Right, so that was the gist of that. Right, n equal to 3, great. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Tapiso. Okay, great. Okay, guys, uh, let me just see. Uh, then the other thing I wanted to. So, so that theorem says that if you have a polynomial P of x equal to a subscript and x to the n plus plus a1 x plus a naught. If they have integer coefficients, then every rational zero of P is of the form P over Q, where P is a factor of the constant coefficient, uh, A subscript naught, and Q is a factor of the leading coefficient, A subscript N. So that's important. So I want us to look at example one quickly, and maybe just get that one off us, and then, and then we can proceed. So I'm going to write down example one based on that um, rational zeros theorem, okay? So let's just write down example one. 
based on that. So, so this is based on real zeros of polynomials. So, so from from the sixth edition, uh, there's this example one. Um, Is example one. Um, can you guys see the screen there? I'm not sure um, if the students are seeing or if it's just me. I see your pen is moving, but I'm not seeing the ink on the page. Um, oh, no. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I see an E, and that's it. And let the pen is moving, but there's nothing. Yeah, let me just share it again. Thanks for that, Ms. Brum. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So let me just share it again and then see what's happening. Uh, let me stop sharing that. Okay. So I'm sharing uh, the whiteboard again. Great. Example one. How is that now? Better? It's still coming. Okay. Is it okay? Not yet. Oh, not oh. appearing yet. Okay, let me. Ah, oh, wonder what's happening now. Because now I stopped the. Uh, I let me just check if I try this other Wi-Fi now. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Let me stop sharing. Share again. Okay, and down, Ms. Brown? <laughs> Yes, I see example one and it's underlined. Is that okay. it? Okay. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, I was trying to write other things, but I don't know what happened. Okay, I hope okay. that everyone else can see that now. Yes, they can. Is it okay? Great. Okay, so let's see. Find. Uh, find the rational zeros of. Mm -mm. Doctor, see, as your pen is moving again, but there's nothing, there's no ink. Okay. Ah, there we go. Find the. Uh, oh, wow. Wow. This is, this is a bit delayed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Find the rational. Oh, so now I'm writing on top of it because it's also coming slow from my side. I don't know. Uh, I'm also having a problem now with this. That's why it's written like that. Can you see? Because I'm. I have to check out. Probably, I probably have to replace this, but it's fine. I'll, I'll check it out. Okay. I have to get a new pin and find the. Okay. So it says find the rational zeros. Find the rational zeros. Find the rational zeros of. And the rational zeros of I'll just have a quick discussion on it because this is painful now. Find the rational zeros of P of X. If P of X equal to X cubed minus 3X plus 2. Okay, guys. All right. I just want to have a quick talk about that. Find the rational zeros of p of x uh, equal to x cubed minus 3x plus 2. Okay. So let us just, before we start with the problem, let us just unpack it a bit. So I hope everyone can see that, Ms. Brown. Yes, it it, your, it does so, come a little bit a few seconds after you've written, yeah, but it yeah. does appear. So that's I'm having fine. the same. I'm having the same yeah. issue, and then no, and then I write fine. on top of other things. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but it does just, it does come just a few minutes later. Then it appears. Yeah, but then by then I mean, I, a few I, seconds. I, seconds. Yeah, but then I'd forgotten what I wrote. You see. Oh my. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So. Let's see. Okay, okay just a quick discussion. Go. Just a quick discussion. Find the rational zeros of this. So I'll, I'll give them a guideline how to solve this. I won't do it yet, okay? So let's go back to the theorem. So the theorem said, let me just go up. 
the theorem stated, uh, the rational zeros theorem. So let me just underline it. It's very important, this theorem. It's saying, it's saying, if the polynomial P of X, and we know what A, A N means, A N minus one, A one, A naught, those are, those are integers, okay? Positive or negative. And we know what X to the N means. Uh, those are powers of X. So, and, and are we have a polynomial now, P of X equal to X cubed minus three X plus two, okay? So if the polynomial P of X equal to A subscript N X to the N plus plus A one X plus A naught is integer coefficients, which our example is also, because the coefficients for our example are one minus three and two. Okay, there's a constant coefficient there. Then every rational zero of P is of the form P over Q. Okay, it's of the form P over Q, where P is a factor of the, 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 the constant coefficient A naught, right? And Q is a factor of uh, A N. And Q is a factor of a n, right? So that's what you need to know. So the rational zeros will have the form P over Q. Now for us, what is our a naught and what is our a n? What is our a naught here? Well, for us, if you look at what we need to find, we know, let me just write it down. So it means that, Every rational zero for us oh this is this is really bad. Okay, I'll have to. Every rational zero So every rational zero um, is of the form P over Q. Right. So that's how the lady is on my side. Okay, I suspect I must change this point now. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, guys, so uh, I just wanted to say there that our P over Q is uh, 2 over 3. So we have to look at all those factors of 2 and 3 then, okay? So the form 2 over 3. Right. Uh, let me see. Uh, it's two and one. Sorry, two and one. So we look at factors. So we look at factors here. So remember, P will be a factor of this. And Q, according to that theorem, Q is a factor of this here. Uh, there's a one there in front. Right. And the factors of two are plus or minus two, right? Plus or minus two, and plus or minus one also. And the factors of one are plus or minus one. So these are all the factors that we will consider. Right. So it will be of that form, E over Q, okay? Right. So the rational zeros of P are one, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, okay? That's what you have there. So, so since the leading coefficient is one, any rational zero must be a divisor of the constant term two, right? So the possible rational zeros are plus or minus one, and plus or minus two. And then all you have to do is to check plus or minus one when you substitute it in here, when you substitute it, in the polynomial function in the place of x. So what you will do is you'll put you'll put in there, you'll first put right, you'll first put minus one, get p minus one, 
put minus one in the place of X. Then you'll put one, positive one. Then you'll put minus two and check P of minus two. And then you'll check P of two. And then in that way, you'll see which one of those values gives you P of X equal to zero, okay? Those ones that give you P of X equal to zero when you substitute that, that uh, constant number in the place of X, those ones will give you, in fact, they will be the roots or they will be the zeros of that polynomial. So for example, so according to the theorem, I must check the factors here, plus or minus one, plus or minus two. And uh, for the constant term here, that's plus or minus one. Now, of course, if, if you say P over Q, this will be two, will be plus or minus two, divided by plus or minus one. Right? And then you'll test each of those. You'll test each of those numbers, okay? Right. That's what you'll do there. So your rational will be of that form, plus or minus two over plus or minus one. And you can see you'll just get an integer, okay? You'll just get, a, you'll just get plus or minus two. Uh, and then you'll also check uh, plus or minus one. Okay, that's what you'll do there. So the other factors of two are the other factors of two are plus or minus one. So it's plus or minus two. The other factors are plus or minus one. Sorry guys, this is taking time. So I'm looking at the factors of two in top, and Q's factors remain the same, plus or minus one, according to the theorem. And the possibilities that you'll get, of course, the possibilities that you'll get are these possibilities. So what you'll do is, so what you'll do is these are the final possibilities, plus or minus one from here, plus or minus two from there. And you'll see that you'll substitute every time in P of X, you substitute P of one, see if you get zero. P of minus one, see if you get zero. P of two see if you get zero, P of minus two, see if you get zero. If we substitute P of two, let's see what we get guys, quickly. Let's just substitute P of two. Well, it's two cube minus three times two is eight minus six plus two. So it's two cube minus three times two. So we get four, so it can't be two, okay? Right, let's substitute minus two now. Let's substitute minus two and see. P of minus two, it's minus two cubed, which is minus eight. Minus three times minus two is six. So it's minus two plus two is zero. So minus two is a zero if you substitute in there. So I would say when you substitute in there, the one that gives you the zero is actually minus two. Right? And then we can try minus one. Let's try minus one. If you substitute minus one in there, P of minus one is minus one Q, which is minus one. Minus times a minus is a plus. So it's four minus one is three, three plus two is five. So uh, minus one is not a zero. We know that minus two is. Let's try one now. Let's try one in there. So now I want to put one in there. One cube is one minus three times one. So it's one minus three is minus two plus two is zero. So the two zeros that I found guys were one and minus two, okay? Right. So that's what you have to do there. You just have to remember what this theorem says. Uh, uh, P over Q, and we wrote down P over Q here, I'll show you, we wrote down P over Q here, uh, we wrote it down here, and we wrote it down here. What are you guys? We wrote it down, initially we wrote it down, but we could see that ultimately it just reduced, we wrote it down here, and uh, also uh, the yeah, wrote it down. But we saw that that ultimately leads to plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Okay, and then we substitute those ones into the original polynomial and see which ones gives you zero. Okay, which ones give you zero? Right. Okay, guys. Any questions there? Sorry for this pin. No, I don't know what's happening here, guys. Any questions there? So that was the the rational zeros theorem. Okay, or, or yeah, the rational zeros theorem. Just have to remember that part. Okay? 
Fine. Any questions there, guys? Any other questions, guys? Any questions for clarification? Yeah, I just applied the, the rational zeros theorem, okay? There was nothing else I used there, right? Sorry for my pain, guys. I'll try and